Working Cows Podcast, episode 360. This episode is brought to you by Ranch Right. This episode is also brought to you by the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. Welcome to the podcast that gives producers a platform to discuss and share paradigm challenging practices. Practices that have increased the effectiveness of their operation and the joy that their families have received from this lifestyle. Howdy, everybody. This is Clay Connery, host of the Working Cows podcast, recorded exclusively in the Understanding Ag Studios. And this episode is brought to you by Ranch Right. There are three guarantees in life death, taxes, and paperwork. Ranch Right can help you avoid one of them. If you're a successful business, you're probably paying some taxes. But that doesn't mean you have to be stuck inside preparing your paperwork for the accountant. Enlist the team of financial experts at RanchRite to get you back outside doing more of what you love. They are committed to providing you with actionable financials so that you can build a profitable business and create generational wealth. While some things in life are inevitable, being mystified by your numbers doesn't have to be. If you're ready to entrust the paperwork to a team that actually enjoys this type of stuff, then visit RanchRiteLLC.com today and get back out to side to more of the things that you enjoy. Very excited to be joined today by John Haskell. He is the CEO of Ranch Right, and uh, he is joining me to talk today about taxes on April 15th. We're talking on uh, taxes on the day then that taxes are due to be filed. So uh, if you're looking to plan for next year, here's your opportunity. This is a conversation that uh, I had a while back with John, but very good uh, conversation, very detailed and very thorough and really appreciate him taking the time to get prepared and, and to lead this conversation. So here's my conversation with John Haskell. John, thanks for joining me today on the Working Cows podcast. It's an honor, Clay. Thank you very much. This is always, uh, always fun. Yeah. And uh, given given the season that we are in, um, you know, and, and kind of where everybody's head's at, it's always a struggle in podcasting. Do I release it in the season that we're in or do I release it before that so that people can get ready for the season that they're in? And that's kind of the, the benefits of producing evergreen content is you just release it when it when it when it's on your mind and then somebody can go back later and listen to it again and uh, use it to get ready. So anyways, we're in, we're in tax season here. And uh, I, I guess what I wanted to talk to you today about is how do we get ready for tax season? Um, how, what kind of things should we be keeping track of? What kind of things should we be paying attention to? What kind of systems should we have in place to capture and record and keep track of those things so that, um, I would imagine that means that the bill is smaller <laughs> uh, from the accountant, you know, when you turn those things in in an orderly way and they don't have to spend hours and hours sorting through all those things. And so, yeah, just some of those, that kind of philosophy of, of this of this uh, strategy and then some of the actual practical, what do we want to be paying attention to? Yeah, love it. This uh, is an important time of year, as you mentioned, and I'm just going to tell you, if you're listening to this episode now, certainly be ready to replay it for yourself for next year, because the, the biggest thing is preparation is key, right, with so many things. Although that said, we are in February, and so it is not too late to get ready for 2024, even though you're currently scrambling to get 2023 put together. But but uh, I we strongly advocate you know, tax preparation really begin for 2024 begins on January 1st. And that has a couple of important components. A big one is obviously just managing things, you know, making a plan for how you're going to manage things like receipts. Uh, but for some people, it also means having a strategy of how you're going to manage your business uh, so that you can manage your tax bill. And before we jump into that, I want to just talk a little philosophy here. Uh, I, I love the phrase, do not worry about taxes more than the rate you pay. So if you currently don't pay taxes because you don't have a tax liability or you don't, you know, or you pay a very low percentage of your, you know, actual income at, or a you know, small dollar amount annually for taxes, don't spend a lot of time worrying about it. That excludes, of course, 
preparation, which means, you know, doing things like keeping track of expenses, just like you say, so that when you go to your tax account, you actually have, you know, things well documented for to make their life easier. We see, we hear the comment all the time. We see it all the time. Your tax preparation bill generally will be lower if you are prepared. If you take a whole mess to your tax account, you don't have half the stuff and all that. It's likely that your tax bill may be higher, but your tax preparation bill most certainly will be higher. Most accountants bill by the hour. So if you make their life harder, it takes longer. It costs more. But let's let's do a few philosophy things first. Um, and I want to make sure that I always start by saying, you know, and I'm going to end by saying this too, if you'll remind me, never cheat on taxes. Never, never, never cheat on taxes. Uh, it, there's, there's really no two ways to say it. There are lots of wonderful tax strategies that are available to us that allow us to manage taxes. The tax code is full of gray area. Those are, you know, matters between you and your tax accountant as far as where you live in the gray. I'm good with all that, but there are things that are illegal and we do not do those. And and I will tell you that IRS is not somebody you want to mess with. Uh, pretty easy. Um, Jesus said, render unto Caesar what I, is Caesar's. I, I love that uh, quote. And that's exactly <laughs> right. Yeah, good. He didn't. He didn't say anything about doing it joyfully. I don't think, but uh, he did say. Ah, <laughs> uh, he did say to be joyful in your persecutions, though, and I think that that would fit very appropriately for some people. All right, all right, you got it. <laughs> good, but that that's the perfect reference, and that's the that is good advice to follow, right? Which is mm -hmm. the, now we can argue about uh, we can argue about taxes and the generality of that, and I do think it's appropriate for me to sort of give you my biases, which are uh, the tax code is the rule of the road. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Uh, I believe in general that government spending is both essential and simultaneously incredibly wasteful. Uh, we all can think of examples where the government does terrible things with our, what I think of as our sacred money, right? They collect it under severe penalties and often do crappy things with it. Um, so I have become a believer, you know, seeing the inner workings of government, I've seen, you know, become a believer in very limited government, maybe enough so that makes lots of people uncomfortable. We don't, I, I don't say that because that's where I'm coming from, just that's my bias. So if it comes up, that's what's going to tell us. The other thing is wonderful people like Art Laffer, uh, who's famous, if you've ever seen Ferris Bueller's day off, you learned the Laffer curve taught by uh, Ben Stein, right? A fantastic economist. Uh, higher tax rates don't generate higher tax revenue. There's a big distinction there. And there's a wonderful book, that La a new book that Laffer is a co-author on called Taxes Have Consequences. It's available on Amazon. It, if you're a geek like me interested in this stuff, it's fascinating. My wife watches me read this book and it's like, you're, you're reading a book on taxes before bed? Like, Anyway, and it keeps me up at night. It doesn't put me to sleep. So anyway, it, it uh, ta taxes ha are ways to influence people's behavior. And the important thing that Tom Wheelwright and some others point out, Laffer also, is that when taxes are put into place, especially deductions, credits, those sorts of things, they are designed to get people to do things. So, for example, there is a tax credit for providing housing to people. There is a tax credit for you know, exploring for oil. There are currently tax credits for driving electric vehicles, right? The government wants you to do things and they're willing to pay you for them. We have some wonderful tax benefits in our industry. Uh, the, the, you know, the government wants people to raise food, right? They want us to pursue conservation practices, all those sorts of things. And they motivate those primarily through the tax code. We can have a debate about whether that's the best way to do it, et cetera. I don't want to have that debate. I just want you to know that those are the rules and following the rules is our duty. So that's what we do. Uh, that is that is the rendering and the Caesar part. And people like Tom Wheelwright make great arguments that, you know, there is a real case to be made for, hey, we're trying to get these things done. Let's help. Right. There are wonderful benefits to providing housing for people. There are wonderful benefits for growing food. We don't just do it for the tax benefits, but the tax benefits can augment our otherwise good efforts. So I think that's most of my... Oh, the last thing is, again, for me personally, uh, my goal with is to maximize after-tax wealth. And some people have the goal of paying 
no taxes. And, and that is, that can be a goal that's valid. I think that's a less, it's a less interesting goal to me because again, what we're trying to do most of the time and what we're trying to do with our clients is build really profitable businesses. And then we'll worry about the taxes afterwards, but there could be two strategies and I mentioned business strategies earlier as a form of preparation, but there could be two strategies that yield the same amount of profit, but one leaves more money in my pocket at the end. And that is that is a, an important distinction. And again, there I'm generally only talking about um, situations where you're already in a very profitable business. Uh, a, a poorly profitable or a moderately, moderately profitable business often doesn't have um, much of a tax issue. Um, this this comes down to the fundamental principle of compounding within our businesses. And if I, you know, compounding is the idea that the money you make then makes money, right? So when we think about this from investing, I invest a dollar, the dollar makes five cents. Now the five cents earns interest, you know, on and on. Um, when I compound in a profitable small business, I have the opportunity to grow my money effectively, you know, with the power of an exponent as opposed to just addition. Um, when I pay taxes, I take money out of my business. Now, I, there's a level of taxes we have to pay. I'm fine with that. But if I have a strategy that leaves more money in my business uh, and optimizes my tax level, it allows me to compound at a faster rate. Yeah, no, that makes makes a lot of sense. And I, I was just in a meeting the other day, and one of the significant players in that meeting said, uh, it's my experience that ranchers will slit their own throats to avoid paying right. taxes. And I think that that is the opposite of what you're talking about. Correct. Like, we need to make sure the business is really humming, and then we'll figure out how to pay the tax bill. Yeah. And that said, I don't know about you, but there is nothing less fun than writing a tech check to the IRS at the end of the year. I, I, this whole thing about payroll deductions and how they hold it, I think they need to make everybody write the check. Like at the end of every month, you're going to sit down and say, okay, I made $1,000 and here's 300 that I get to send to the government. Like yeah. it's painful and it sucks, but yes, don't be stupid about it, right? Uh, just, right. just do it correctly. Right. From a philosophical perspective, and maybe you're going to get into this, but uh, is it would it be the case that you want to try to bump up against the top of the bracket rather than be you know just over the line? Like if you realize, oh, if I make that much profit this year, which we're all understanding, ranching for profit, planning for a profit, yep. understanding yep. those things ahead of time, right? But if we 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 uh, if we realize, oh, I'm going to make this much profit this year, it's going to put me just over into the next bracket, is that worth saying, well, maybe we don't want to do that this year, or maybe we want to figure out a way to scale it so that we get to the top of the bracket instead or whatever? It's a great question. And it's something you hear a lot of. And I find it fascinating because it, again, if we're, if you're a U.S. based listener, especially, uh, I think you have audience I know in Canada and, and probably in Australia, New Zealand, you know, English speaking, our tax codes are mm -hmm. all fairly similar. Uh, but in the U.S. especially, we have these sort of very distinct breaks in the tax code, uh, percentage wise. And the thing to remember about that that really matters is, yes, sometimes adding another dollar kicks you up into a new bracket. But what you have to remember is that it's only the additional dollars that are taxed at that rate. So let's say I'm in a 20 percent tax bracket and I'm going to jump to 30 and I made one hundred dollars. Well, if I make one hundred and one dollars, the first hundred is taxed at 20 the $1 is taxed at 30. Now you can decide if you'd rather have the 70 additional cents or not, but almost always, and there are states like California, Illinois, New York, that their state tax, their state income tax on top of the federal income tax. I mean, at one point, I don't know if it's still the case, but at one point, California's top marginal in, uh, income tax on W-2 earners was over 62%. Right. So at that point, and this was within the last few years, I don't know what it is now. I haven't kept up. Uh, but but again, at that point, do you want to add a dollar and keep, you know, 38 cents? Maybe, maybe not. You can make that decision. You're still better off with the 38 cents right, right. now. If it depends what it costs you to make it, that sort of thing. But but those are places where we often try to shoot for. You know, my goal, an optimal strategy in my mind, and and again, this is just one man's opinion, 
uh, is that you do sort of play those brackets. You you put yourself comfortably into one of the lower end brackets, and then you and then you pay those taxes. Um, again, there's there's nothing wrong with you know putting yourself in a situation where you pay no taxes necessarily, but it isn't necessarily the the most it doesn't generate the most wealth. Um, right. You may be just like you say, slitting your throat to get to that strategy. Now, one thing that is from a strategy standpoint that everybody, particularly young people, have to understand is that growth is tax deductible in large measure. And I should qualify everything I say here, except don't cheat on taxes is like generally. OK, we're going to make some super broad generalizations here. And I've I have never gotten hate mail from a podcast episode, but I'm sure it's coming. But these are the places where we get in trouble, right? So when we grow a business, small business is something the government wants us, you know, that's an activity they want us to to engage in. Sometimes they make it seem like they don't, but um, they really do. And and small business is, is a lot of what powers our U.S. economy. Same in Canada, same in Australia, New Zealand. Um, Growing that business, investing in that business is tax deductible. The part where we slit our throat is often where we buy expenses um, or, or, or assets that are really expenses, right, in kind of the Kiyosaki type definition, assets that take money out of our pockets, and especially if we finance them um, to reduce our tax bill. We can buy stuff, though, that increases future tax liability or potentially does or increases our cash flow and use that to save uh, on our taxes. And to me, that's the best strategy, right? If I can grow my business, if I can invest in more livestock, if I can invest more in the things that generate more income, and that is tax deductible, that is a wonderful strategy. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Yep, so, so I can go buy, I can make a down payment on a tractor and finance it to to get a tax deduction. Okay. And then I have, I have debt that I now need to pay with after tax dollars to get that thing paid off. Right. That can be an absolute killer. We watch people do that over and over again and put themselves out of business. Um, but if I buy cows, for example, and I, and I can run a cow profitably, then now I am making the problem potentially worse next year, but then next year I can go buy more cows. And you say, well, but my ranch is only so big. Well, yeah, but w there are lots of ways around those things. The other thing that came as a, this is related to, especially when we buy livestock or we buy um, residential real estate, we have the ability to take, uh, especially now, accelerated depreciation. And ex depreciation is just an absolutely wonderful gift in the world of livestock and residential real estate. The average you know, residential house does not decrease in value, right? It goes up in value. Now it requires repair and maintenance and all that, and that's fine. But I mean, basically the real estate lobby has done something wonderful where you get to depreciate a property while it's increasing in value. We have the exact same opportunity with cattle. We can depreciate females while they increase in value. And you say, oh, well, yeah, but they also depreciate. Absolutely, they do. But you can manage your herd in such a way so that you are only depreciating an appreciating asset, which is awesome. <laughs> yeah. And I'm going to say the only two times, the only two, I am a, a pastor by trade. That means that I have a certain set of deductions that are open to me yes. that aren't open to the general public. Um, and so I, I rarely pay in taxes, but the, the only two times I've paid in taxes are when I ran out of depreciation. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's exactly right. And and we have the ability to, it's so much more so after 2016, to manage the depreciation, right? So I may need a lot of depreciation in a year. Well, I can I can set it up so that that's what I that's what I take without necessarily changing the underlying asset purchase. Um, and conversely, if I need to spread it out over a longer period of time, I do. Now, I hear people all the time talk about how worried they are about accelerated depreciation, all that. I tell people all the time, I'm a huge fan of the optional, the option to accelerate depreciation. That doesn't mean we take it, right? We may, mm -hmm. we may take it on a normal schedule if that's what we need, right? But we have the ability, I mean, Again, look at the prices of cows right now, the prices of heifers. You can wipe out a lot of income with accelerated depreciation on those. And again, I can be fairly certain that that cow or that heifer are going to 
to produce more cash flow for me in the coming year. Yep. Very good. I, I'm going to attempt to help somebody like me remember something here. So bear with me for a second. Yes. I need, I need things. I need to connect things to other things in my mind to remember them. So I know I've heard that before that only the next dollar is taxed at the higher rate. Yes. Uh, so don't worry too much about that. Um, and here's how I'm going to connect that only uh, not every cow got the supplement, not just the cows that needed it. Right. That's right. It's the same idea, almost the inverse of the same idea. Yep. And so yeah, that's if, if that helps somebody else remember that. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it, uh, and it, and it, this is why we always talk about marginal tax rates, right? So, so it's, it's the, the tax rate on the next dollar, the tax rate on the next dollar. And, and that is what changes. And I think we sometimes think, well, wait a minute. And, and these cases do exist where you make an extra hundred dollars and then you actually wind up making less money. More prevalent in the W-2 world than it is in our world. Um, but those cases do exist. But generally, that's not the problem, right? You just say, well, OK, the tax bill went up, but you're still better off. And, and so, again, do you want to make more money? It, again, I do. I want I want to make and keep more money. So that's the goal. So we do, we do with it as we, as we can. And I think, again, it's easy to get into these things where we really spend a lot of time worrying about something that probably doesn't produce that big of a change. I don't think now I've seen some people encounter some horrendous tax bills um, that were, I can't think of any that were devastating to the business, but they were darn sure had short, you know, did short term damage and were very expensive. But again, it was because there was a, a significant profit that was essentially not managed as well as it should have been. Um, and they were caught by surprise. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I think that's another part. Uh, if we can segue just a little in the preparation part of this, we try to get every single one of our clients to begin looking at their potential tax bill as early as September. So we have stalker, um, operators in the South Plains, right? They ship most of their cattle out in September and then they start buying, or in August, let's say a July, August, and then they start buying back in the fall. Well, there's a really nice downtime period there where we can meet with our tax accountant right then and say, okay, if this is our projection from now until the end of the year, what, what can we do now for some people, if you're a cow calf, you know, producer north of I-80 and you're selling calves in November, you're you know, you're kind of more up against it. If you've contracted those calves through a superior sale or something, you got a pretty good idea what your income is going to look like. Well, there's no reason not to start the process of tax preparation in the quarter or more before the end of the year. And that gives you the ability to make good decisions uh, before there's a time crunch. There are things you can do after the end of the year. So we're at February 27th when we're recording this. I assume it's a few weeks before it comes out. Um, you know, you don't have many options right now for 2023. But in September, October, November of 2023, you've got all kinds of options. We try to push those meetings so that we have multiple meetings through the fall so that we say, okay, here's what we think is going to happen to the end of the year. If that happens, here's what the tax bill could look like. And then you basically set it up as a nice formula where, okay, we didn't have the 100000 in calf in or stocker income that we thought we're going to retain those heifers. So now what does it look like? Okay, we we sold extra calves or, or the price was better than we thought or they were heavier. So now we have extra income. What impact does that have? And as we get down in the last quarter, we continue making those adjustments. It gives us the ability at the, you know, on, on 1231, December 31st to say, okay, we have a pretty good idea of what our tax bill is going to look like. And that to me is a very powerful strategy, right? Or, or a very powerful tactic, if you will, in a larger strategy of optimizing your after-tax wealth. Because once we get to January 1st, you know, then people say, well, I could play games and I could predate checks and all that. Like, no, that's not, you're not, you're not doing it then. You gotta, you gotta have it running months before the end of the year. Right. And I think Dallas Mount, I maybe recently said this on the podcast that, um, you know, maybe we go ahead and we pay the five figure tax bill, but we're able to squirrel away high five or six figures into future business resiliency. And I think a lot of people hear that five figure tax bill and they're like, eh, but they miss the part about putting six figures in savings, yeah, right. <laughs> you know, like, or whatever that might look like, you know, it's yes. like, 
we should. Okay. But yeah. the problem I have with that, and I have no argument with what Dallas is saying. I, I, sometimes people say, boy, you and Dallas seem to disagree. Like Dallas and I are great friends. I have huge respect for Dallas, the school, the things he teaches, et cetera. So if you haven't been to the ranching for profit school, here is my plug. You have to go. If you haven't been to Wallace. And I was just in a workshop where he plugged your work, John. So awesome. it, it goes That's both nice. ways. <laughs> we, we, I, I we, have wonderful visits and and I like arguing for sport. I know he does too, so it's good fun. So uh, so with that, where we see the problem is you generate it, and we'll get to this a little more later, but you generate a significant tax liability, but you don't have the money. And so yes, mm-hmm. I'm with you, I'm with you and Dallas when it's like, well, if I can, you know, if I have to pay a fifty thousand dollar tax bill to put a hundred thousand in my account, like I'll I'll think about that. The biggest problem, though, is when we have debt service and we have a significant IRS profit, but then our debt service takes all of our cash. Now we can't actually pay the bill. And I have seen a number of situations where people, they take the ranching for profit school. They work with us. They, they take Wally's sell by marketing school or they take Doug's. They run out of accumulated dep- or, uh, you know, loss. Uh, suddenly drawing a blank on prior year loss, you know, that they can deduct, Mm. they've run out of depreciation. And then all of a sudden there's a $150,000 tax bill and there isn't $150,000 in the bank because they're paying it all on their mortgage and their cow note and a tractor loan. That's where you're not putting money in the bank and you're generating a significant tax bill. Now in a business like Dallas's uh, ranching for, you know, the school ranching for profit, he doesn't have you know, there isn't a mortgage per se. Now I'm sure there's, there may be debt on the business. I don't know, but, but, but that's a place where a a cash cow type business can weather that well, because they usually end the year with the cash. And then that's what they owe taxes on. In a ranch situation, we often can end with a tax liability and not have any cash. And that's where people get in trouble. And that's where the preparation is very, very important. The not having the cash also can really limit what your options are even before the end of the year. So one of the things we can't do is prepay when we don't have money in our account, right? So you can prepay expenses for the next year up to, you know, reasonable limits and that sort of thing. But if you don't actually have the money, then the IRS won't allow you to do that. Um, and so th- those are situations, you know, again, the goal is after tax wealth accumulation for me. So if I have to pay some tax along the way, you know, I'm going to be okay with it. Right. If I get hit with a hundred and fifty thousand dollar tax bill, though, I'm going to tell you I haven't done my job fully. That that's too much, right? There's a limit there where it's like, right. yeah, that's a lot. Let's take a quick break and hear a word from our sponsor today, the South Dakota Grassland Coalition. If you're in the business of managing livestock, you've probably experienced drought, shortage of time, not enough help, and hefty debt. But facing one or even all of these challenges doesn't have to leave you worrying about how you'll make it through another year. Learn how to increase your stocking rates, extend your grazing season, increase plant diversity, retain moisture in your soil, spend less time and money on weed control, and much more at one of the South Dakota Grassland Coalition's grazing schools. During this three-day intensive program, Area producers, along with presenters from state and local agencies, combine hands-on activities in the field with classroom-style presentations to walk you through the steps necessary to create a grazing plan that suits your unique operation. Reserve your spot at one of the three grazing schools today at sdgrass.org. Is there more philosophically, and I know we've talked a little bit of practice on on this too, but is there more philosophically or or can we move into exclusively talking about practice? You bet. No, but let's maybe a little segue is to talk a little about entities. Is that fair? Um, so entities, what, I, what do I mean by that? What kind of business are you? So most people in our industry are some version of sole proprietor or even a partnership, but they, they uh, you know, they basically just it's all, everything is reported on their personal tax return. There's no LLC or GP or general partnership or corporation, you know, involved. That impacts taxes. Um, It impacts liabilities, but um, most many, I want to think carefully about how I say this. There, There are ways through managing entities that can help you or hurt you in your ability to manage your taxes. Um, There are other non-tax reasons to do things like form an LLC or form a general partnership or form a corporation. 
Um, those are all fine and, and have their own validity. We want to be very careful when we do that, though, that we understand the interplay between the, the liability protection, for example, of an LLC and how that plays onto your tax return. Um, how, how our tax election even within an LLC affects our tax return. So, for example, if I have an LLC that that through you know depreciation, for example, generates a loss, I can use that on my personal return to offset uh, my wife's uh, you know W two income that she receives as an MD, right? Um, there, so we want to be, we want to think carefully about how we do that. I want to always go back to the rule of you want to keep that as simple as you possibly can, but you also want to be strategic about the benefits. There are benefits to different entity structures. I don't want to get into the details of that, but it, that is wor something worth looking into. There are some real disadvantages. And I really uh, had a wonderful conversation with a tax preparer from Montana recently where we were talking about the fact that at one time the tax law really favored one particular type of corporation. It was an S corp in this case. And so you see all these ranches in Montana and Wyoming that are S corps that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, well, the laws changed and they no longer are a big advantage. And so maybe then you're looking for a way to get out of an old entity structure that, um, that was an advantage in the past and which no longer is. Those, those types of changes can be a little bit complicated, uh, but they're definitely worth thinking through because there can be times and years when it's like, ooh, here's, you know, we could set that up ahead of time and say, okay, we have this corporation that we'd kind of like to convert to an LLC, let's say. So, let, and I say convert in the loosest of terms, but we're going to change our entity structure, right? So what would be the parameters that would allow us to do that with the least amount of negative consequences uh, to derive the most amount of future benefit? Well, it may not be in a year when markets and profits are high. It may be years when you have a drought and, and markets are low, right? But you could set that up and have it kind of all teed off to take place when those conditions arose. Uh, it's it, now it's much easier going the other way, right? It's easier to go from a Schedule F filer to to an entity. Um, but again, you hear a lot of talk about S corporations, uh, you know, LLCs that elect as S corporations and all these great tax advantages. Well, those, some of those could go away, um, and that's a choice that you want to think about. But also, some of those limit your options. Uh, you may or may not be able to take that loss that you generate in your in your company against W-2 income, depending on the, the tax election of that LLC. So for example, uh, an S corp has to keep its losses basically self-contained, meaning you can't use that on your taxes to offset other types of income. So again, I don't want to get into the details of that, but, but they do matter. And I do believe there is great reason to, to be involved with, to actually form an entity, but I want to keep that entity just very, very bare bones simple. Uh, for lots of reasons. Right. And I think that when you and I were having a conversation about this, when I was looking at setting up an LLC for the, the podcast, that you told me at that time, at least, that there was some number of months after the formation of that where you could go back and retroactively change it to another form if that if if the income became such that it made sense to do that. Yep. Is that, that, that is true? absolutely true. And, and I will say the IRS uh, and the federal government, especially are pretty darn forgiving in your first year of operation. Uh, they, they basically understand that, Oh, you're new at forming an LLC. You're kind of a dummy. You're going to screw some stuff up and they're pretty darn forgiving. Uh, now, again, dealing with the IRS is its own things, you know, even just getting letters back and forth from them, you know, it can be incredibly time consuming. But but they are set up for new, you know, for to help new businesses, basically. So, yes, I think uh, that what we were talking about was like you have 75 days or whatever to make the S election after the beginning of the year, which would be retroactive to the first of the year. Right. And I think that another thing that as I've set up two LLCs in the last year, um, one of the things that the lawyer always repeats in that meeting where you go in and sign your documents is keep your personal expenses and your LLC expenses separate because you vaporize yep. the li the liability protection. Yep. If if you don't, they're going to pierce the corporate yep. veil is what they call it. And then you're you you personally are exposed to liability, not just the company. So I think that yep. bears repeating. It bears a lot of repeating. And this is where simplicity matters because I, we see it too often. Uh, most it's we see it a lot with people coming to us. 
that have they've been advised by an attorney to to make things too complex. Well, as soon as you don't follow the rules, all of the protection that you think you've signed up for go away. And it's not exactly that clear cut. There's a great book, Veil Not Fail, if you've ever uh, seen that one um, written. I can't think of the guy's name, an attorney. But I mean, again, there are lots of ways to make these things fancy, make them really hard, and then you generally make them completely ineffective. Um, and I, and I, now the other thing you have to remember is every additional entity requires its own tax preparation, right? So you also add expense. There is a level there where, you know, if you're not making enough money, it's just not worth it because now you have to pay extra in tax prep. Well, we don't want to do that. That's why we want to keep it really simple. Things like the very simple LLCs, either sole proprietorships or even partnerships, but, you know, LLCs with a partnership type tax election are very easy. They don't add a lot of extra time. They don't add a lot of extra complexity. They add some liability protection, but you have to follow the rules. Going to a corporation is a whole nother level of stuff, right? Then you have to have a board of directors. You have to file reports. Like it's, it's a pain. And the tax returns are generally more expensive. And at this point, for in a lot of cases, the way the law is now, the benefits aren't that great. Um, in some cases that, you know, specific cases they are, but sort of across the board, they're not, they're not nearly as good as they could be. So I think that's a good, that's a really good comment, Clay. Uh, you know, again, we, we want to do this at the right level. And, and we talk in our company, we talk a lot about transformations, right? What are we trying to do? We're trying to help people achieve their dreams, right? Every business is unique. Everybody's dreams and vision are unique. Everybody's needs are unique. But the the single most common transformation most of us need to make is exactly what you talked about. Get the personal separated from the business. They teach that in Ranching for Profit. Um, we teach that again and again. We repeat it again and again. It makes your life so much better. And it frankly makes your tax preparer, uh, makes their life better. So when we talk about preparation, having a separate business account where business transactions reside, even if it's just a personal account that you have a separate debit card for and use for business transactions, that makes your tax preparer's life way easier. And again, the tax mm-hmm. preparer pay, you know, charges by the hour. So if you're making his or her life easier, you're probably making your bill less. All right. So should we jump into some specific numbers about uh, you know things you should do? Yep. Practical. Right. So I Okay, there are some best practices here. Uh, tra- keeping track of receipts is very, very important. So, so we already talked about separating business and personal. So now let's say I have a checking account that I only use for my business. Whether it's a business checking account or not, doesn't really matter. It only gets used for the business. Just for the record, I'm not a big fan of Profit First. I have seen people use it and use it very effectively, and it has done wonderful things for them. Most people I see that use Profit First, Profit First is a system of setting up a whole series of bank accounts. Uh, There's a book by the same name. If you're interested, I don't recommend reading it and following the advice, but you could read it just for personal info. It sounds like a great idea. You set up all these different accounts. You put money in the different accounts for the different things. Uh, So for example, you have multiple checking accounts or or a checking account with multiple savings account. You say, okay, I'm going to pay myself X dollars and I'm going to put X aside for taxes and I'm going to put X aside for you know, peanuts and I'm going to put X aside for whatever. Uh, Often what we see is people do great at it for three months and then the whole thing sort of implodes. And then you just have transfers going between different bank accounts. It makes no sense. And you're, you're, you save money by accident by kind of hiding it from yourself because you can't transfer it. (laughs) My biggest problem with profit first, I see a lot of people that have money in the bank, but they write the check off the wrong account, the check bounces. And so then they wind up with check fees and it's like, well, this is dumb. Why are we doing this? So, okay. So I don't recommend that, but it's an approach. Uh, If you're going to do something like that, I don't mind a separate account for things like payroll taxes, right? So I have an employee, right? I write him a check for $100 a year or whatever it is, whether he needs it or not. I have to take out his self-employment tax, right? And I have to, and I have to put in my portion, or I said self-employment tax, I meant employment tax, uh, 7.65%. And then I have to put in my match, which is the other 7.65%. I, I am not uncomfortable with an account that tracks that just so that you never mess that one up. It's very, very important. I think there are better ways to do it. We do it through your balance sheet and show what that amount is constantly. So we always know that it's there, but you could do that with, uh, you could do that with a savings account. You're not going to bother me in the least. 
Um, but I, but at once you're up to like six bank accounts, you know, past three, you're not managing it well. I promise. It takes more time to manage it than the benefit it provides. Right. You need a okay. CFO well, at that point. <laughs> correct. Yeah. And you're probably not Apple, so you probably don't need a CFO. <clears throat> okay. So, so with that, keeping those transactions separate and then documenting them. Okay. Now we see business owners that think, oh, I, I own a business. Everything I do is deductible. Like, mm, no, it's not true. So one of the other transformations we work through with people is, yes, when you stop and get a six pack of beer on the way home, just because you pay for it with your ranch debit card doesn't make it a work expense, right? You know, I mean, they're just all these things where it's like, yeah, remember what the rule is, right? It has to be a reasonable and justifiable expense for the business. So if you live in a town and you, or you live, you know, 10 miles out of 30 miles out of town and you eat lunch in that town every day, that really isn't a tax deductible expense. Okay. That is you eating lunch out. Now, one thing to remember with meals again, 2016, I think has done some wonderful things for us, but this isn't terribly popular. There used to be a category called meals and entertainment. And, and in a lot of accounting software, it still is labeled as that entertainment is not deductible anymore. So if I'm taking people to football games, uh, you know, to, to wow them as clients, that is not deductible. And meals are only 50% deductible. So I've, I did the math a couple of years ago and I think it figured it cost me four, four or five, I think it was five times more to eat out than it cost me to eat at home. And I only get to deduct half of it. So I am actually losing. The other thing you're doing, if you're eating out all the time or incurring additional expenses so for the tax deduction is you're making your business suck, right? And again, our goal is a profitable business. So especially if you are starting out or you're in kind of a, you know, you're trying to get this business to a new place, don't spend all your money eating out. Like it's, it, that doesn't make your business run better, right? Spend money on things that make your business better. Uh, that that's where you really need to stay focused. The, and, and again, the tax deduction doesn't turn out to be meaningful enough to make any difference. Okay. So let's go a little further on meals. Technically, if you take someone to lunch, uh, as a business expense, that has to have a business purpose and you should be documenting who you have that meal with. And if these are potential clients, as an example, if you were to get audited, um, those could be looked at of, you know, did these people actually become clients? So, you know, calling everyone you ever go to lunch with a potential client is, is really not a great idea. Now I periodically take potential clients to lunch. My conversion rate is high, right? So I can say, yes, I took that person to lunch and they did not become a client, but I took eight others that did become clients. So, you know, I think we're okay there. Reasonable and and justifiable is the is the thing you got to come back to. What is that thing? What is that expense doing to contribute to your business? I'm going to say again. I've said this a hundred times in the last couple of years. You recall that part of the big uh, Biden administration's deal was to hire a bajillion new IRS agents. The IRS has been behind the eight ball. They like to whine about how underfunded they are and how bad they have it. They are trying to fix that. They have a lot of new agents coming, and I think I think audits are going up. And so you may have been able to get away with this for years. You might not continue to. Um, I, I think we, I, again, I think we want to run a good business. I think when you have a good business, uh, the rest will take care of itself. The, okay, so a, let's go. Is there an interval at which people should expect IRS audits? I mean, we, no, it's just random. Not that I, not that I know of. I mean, I don't know if it's random, but right. it's... It, I don't know that there's an expect, you know, every seven years you're going to talk to them. Right. Yeah. We definitely see our Canadian customers get audited a lot. Hmm. Our, our U S customers, it doesn't, it's rare. Right. Yeah. And we, we've owned, uh, small businesses, um, pretty much continuously for the last, uh, 15 years or so and have never been audited, but that's just, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Knock on wood. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <clears throat> Very good. But we'll we've see. never we've never filed taxes without a CPA doing it. So uh, that's <laughs> right. And and that is an important part of strategy, right? I hate to pay that guy to pay my taxes I, to file my taxes. I could do it. Yeah. Well, one of the things you're getting when you file that is somebody who's also going to be in your corner when it comes time to have that discussion. Their name is on the bottom as well as yours. Right. So. Now that reminds me, there are, you will occasionally run into a tax preparer that won't sign your return. They'll help you prepare it and then you sign it. That's not the way it's supposed to work. 
they sign the return, their names on it. Mm. Uh, they're not, they're not liable for, uh, right. you know, the liability you're on the hook for the liability, but you do want someone knowledgeable in your corner when it comes time. To- everybody I've ever signed a tax, every tax preparer I've ever signed taxes with has had you sign another document that says, I didn't lie when I gave you these numbers. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> and, and they show that to everybody that will listen, right? <laughs> Which is, Hey, you didn't tell me. And it's a garbage in garbage out system. If you don't tell me about a bunch of income, it's not, doesn't work very well. Uh, yeah. Uh, which bring, which quick segue trading. Lots of people think they're avoiding taxes by bartering. Not correct. Now, usually the barter works out fine and doesn't actually create a tax liability because it's even right. But if you're bartering hay for tools, right, that's a one for one type. If you're bartering your labor for stuff, that's a little different. So you want to be careful there, but but again, under an audit, and and I'm not a tax preparer, so but that is that is going to be looked at, hmm. um, and probably disallowed. Sure. Other practical things we've talked about keeping track of receipts. Um, okay, so let's let's continue with receipts. Uh, normally, there are a couple different ways to do this. There's the old school way of just shove them all in your glove box and deal with it later. Uh, soy ink. I don't know if it evaporates off, rubs off, whatever, but all these new uh, receipts that come out of gas pumps, as an example, leave that thing in your glove box for a week and you will not be able to read it. It will be gone. Right. Uh, okay. We have, an, we have an obligation as the taxpayer to keep documentation of our expenses. Uh, in 1990-something, the IRS, I think it was the early 1990s, the IRS allowed digital copies of receipts. So for example, a photo that you take on your phone. Now in 1990, we didn't have phones, right? So, and we certainly didn't have phones with cameras. We had phones, but they were tied to the wall and had a cute curly Q cord. There's one in the background that you just can't see. Uh, my, uh, right. Uh, taking a picture of a receipt is valid. Now you have to be able to read the receipt. It, you know, you have to be able to see the vendor name and the, you know, the total at the bottom, how you paid for it, that sort of thing. But that is a legit way of keeping receipts. Now, there are there are old analog ways. What I used to do is I'd get my bank statement and then I would have all the receipts and I would attach the receipts to the bank statement. I'd go through the bank statement, check off all the ones I had, staple or paper clip all the receipts to the bank statement, put it in a manila folder, put it in a file drawer. The next month I would do the same thing. And then at the end of the year, I had 12 months of bank statements, all the documenting receipts with explanations written on them, hand that to the tax preparer. That's labor intensive and takes work. I would, I mean, I think I was spending a day a month doing that with a little feed yard, right? I mean, it was, it was a lot of work. Um, now we have a wonderful tool that we use and there are a number of others like it, but there are also a bunch that are garbage. So I would be careful here. Dext, D as in Delta, it's spelled like next. Okay. D-E-X-T, T as in tango. Uh, is a wonderful piece of software. It's fairly cheap, links super well to accounting software, yeah, has has great security features, you know, is a re- relatively low cost. Uh, it is a wonderful app that you can put on your phone and on your computer. You can create an account. For our customers, we we create that account. We do all that for them. But then, but then you, whether you're one of our customers or not, you can use that software, have the app on the phone. When the receipt comes out of the gas station pump, take a picture of the receipt, categorize it, be done. And it, and it will actually push a copy into your QuickBooks that you can match up with your bank transactions. It, it also has a, dig, a wonderful digital archive. It's not the most user-friendly, but it's super good. And so it's searchable, that sort of thing. I have heard of multiple cases where people get audited and they have been very good users of Dex. It used to be called Receipt Bank. It was purchased a few years ago and the name changed. Um, and those Receipt Bank users were able, to, when the IRS auditor asked, you know, what was this expense? They basically were able to say, bang, here's a copy of the receipt, like in seconds, right? What was this? Bang, here's a copy of the receipt. You know, you do this a half dozen times, you're pretty convincing. You know, your credibility is good, right? Whereas the old, like, oh, well, we'll impress him with how disorganized we are and we'll make it all really hard. Like they're only thinking of ways to get you the longer they have to wait, right? The more you can just get them on their way and out the door, the better. So uh, again, Dext is something I strongly recommend. QuickBooks, uh, most everybody knows we use QuickBooks a lot. Uh, QuickBooks has its own app 
it is terrible. I would not recommend using it. It's better than nothing, but it is really bad and it's not very functional. Um, there are a few others, and I am drawing a blank on names now, but there are a few other programs. I would look into that. And there are some free ones. Dext, I think, costs like 20 bucks a month. Um, it is a paid one, but like I said, I think it's the I think it's the gold standard. It is easy to use. It has a great interface on your phone, works well with your camera, all that stuff. So to my mind, that's the best thing you can do. And if you're working with an accountant who knows how to use Dext, that means they can actually set it up so that all of those automatically come to them. So for our customers, they take a picture on their phone. They don't really have to do anything with it other than take the picture and, and push a little green submit thing, and it shows up on our computers. So it makes the process of, of carrying receipts and, and keeping track of them very easy. Now, I'm paranoid and I've kept receipts for many years. So I still actually keep a paper copy of the receipt, but I don't do all the filing stuff that I did before. I just throw it in in case something, I've got a drawer. I throw them all in there in case something happens. Uh, lots of people use Dext and literally just throw, they take the picture of their receipt, throw it out. I have done that a little bit, but every time I do it, it's like, oh, what if it doesn't work? You know. <laughs> yep, very that good. Happens. So that that would be one. The the other one is um you want to and let's go a little oh, uh, let let's talk about some specific things. Um we've talked about preserving receipts. I want to talk a little about making sure we understand how taxes work. Because taxes, tax accounting and business accounting or managerial accounting are very different. And we need to make sure we understand the sort of fundamental basis for how our tax system works. Now, you've heard that, you know, you can file as a cash filer or an accrual filer. In the U.S., I'm going to claim the accrual filing is it's it's very weak. It's not real accrual by the definition I use. And the reason being is it's primarily, you know, money in, money out. And there's some debate about, well, you know, you wrote the check on 1231, but it didn't get cashed until the 3rd of January, right? That I'm not that interested in that. Uh, it really doesn't matter that much, right? But the idea that when we have assets on our tax return, they have what's called a, a, a cost basis or a cash basis, uh, or, or just a basis is probably the best word to use. And what that means is you paid for that asset. So I went and I bought a cow a few years ago and I paid $900 for it. Okay, if I didn't take any depreciation on her, then she's worth nine hundred dollars. As a, as a, well, let me back that up. Let's take depreciation on her. I'm taking a hundred dollars a year of depreciation on her. So you know, two years later, she's worth seven hundred dollars. Okay, we need to understand that that cow, no matter what I paid for, she has a tax value, which is that cash purchase price minus the depreciation. Okay. But she also has a market value. And those two things can have no resemblance to each other whatsoever. So a year ago, I bought some cows for $1,175 that are currently worth $2,500. Okay. Doesn't matter for taxes, right? Now, it matters in the fact that I'm going to have a gain there. But but when I'm depreciating that cow on my taxes, for example, it's the purchase price that matters. And we need to really understand the difference between something's value and its basis. Does that make sense? Yep. Okay. The, the, and this is true for all of our assets. So 2021, truck prices went up, tractor prices went up, right? All machinery went up, but you were still dealing with the purchase price in dollars the day you bought it, okay? And, and there's a big important difference there. Um, a, a place this shows up a lot is also on, or a related idea shows up a lot is accumulated depreciation on your balance sheet. So when you buy a tractor for $100,000 and you, and you depreciate $10,000 a year off of it, let's just say, year two, it's worth 90, year three, it's worth 80, year four, it's worth 70, okay. A lot of tax accountants put that accumulated tax depreciation on your balance sheet, which is great, kind of. I want them to keep track of it, but my tractor might actually be worth more in real life than it is on my tax return. When I take a balance sheet to my banker, I don't want, to, I don't want them to worry about what I've got it on my tax return on, I want them to worry about what's called a fair market value. What could I reasonably sell that tractor for today? That's what I want it to be on my balance sheet that I present to the bank. 
Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for example, if I take accelerated depreciation on that tractor, okay. And I take a, and, and I show it as worth $10,000 on my tax return. I'm not going to go to the bank with a hundred thousand dollar tractor. That's six months old that I took accelerated depreciation on and say that it's worth $10,000 for lending. Right. Does that makes sense. Yep. So, so tax as, as again, wheelwright talks about tax has its own very specific rules of the road. We follow those rules. Uh, we, we, you know, we abide by them. They are the law of tax, but they are not the law of other things. And it's very important that we recognize a clear difference. And I, you know, we have people all the time, like, well, my income on my tax return was, yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't have any interest in that because I can tell you what my income is. And, you know, I, there's no resemblance. Um, mortgage people sometimes will get very confused about this. Uh, I've seen a couple of cases where someone took accelerated depreciation to create a business loss that they could then use to offset W-2 income. And then the ta the uh, mortgage, I'm going to call them a mortgage seller. I don't know if they were even a, as qualified as a broker. <laughs> and they certainly weren't an underwriter, looked at that and said, well, you, you, know, you can't do that. You don't have enough income. And it's like, yeah, that's because they had 179 depreciation that wiped out $300,000 worth of income. You have to add that back to get a mortgage, right? So, so there are all these places where we want to make sure we understand that the rules of the road are very different. And, and that's, a, that's maybe a little less than practical, but I think it helps to guide how we walk through these things, right? Yep. Very good. Very good. All right. Another, another very important thing that people need to be aware of is their tax history. So carry forward loss is a very important thing. Uh, lots of people have it. Nothing to be ashamed of. It's just one of those it's one of those things. Uh, depreciation and the depreciation schedule you are on matters. I've mentioned that we have some real flexibility in depreciation, but you, it is a, you have to choose. And then once you choose a path, now you're on it. So you want to make sure that you sort of abide by those choices and deal with them correctly. I really like thinking about taxes in a three to five year window. It is possible to create a situation where I minimize tax one year and then hurt myself the next year. And it has to do with those brackets like you talked about, right? I could push a lot of income into higher brackets the next year. Whereas if I'm reasonably level at a low to moderate tax bracket year in and year out, I could be, you know, sort of serving my business the best. Um, carry forward losses are kind of a fun one. You want to be aware of those. And again, this is what these prior to end of year tax meetings help us do because we see lots of clients who, uh, and again, we're not we're working with their tax preparer, right? But they have a carry forward loss, but they're worried about a tax liability. It's like, don't even worry about it. It doesn't matter. You, you, you have, you know, basically a get out of jail free card here in this deal uh, that in many cases is worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, but what often happens that we have seen multiple times, and this has happened since Stan Parsons had RFP. I know some of the old school RFPers and HM or HRM people who turned a, a bad business around dramatically. And what happened is they had carry forward loss in the early years. And so they used that loss, right? As they converted to profitability and they weren't, I don't know if uh, I see places where the tax accounts don't really believe that this is going to go on, right? So they don't worry about it much. And maybe the business owner isn't communicating very well with the tax preparer. Well, they're becoming increasingly and increasingly profitable three to five years post, you know, RFP. And during those first couple of years, they have carry forward losses. So there's no tax bill generated. And then all of a sudden they run out of carry forward. They run out of depreciation and now they have a hundred thousand dollar tax bill and they're wondering what in the world happened. And that's a place, again, the, the practical part is please be communicating with your tax preparer. That person isn't, they're not the driver of the bus, but they're a very important member of the team. And you need to be aware of what are the implications of these things because carry forward, I feel like is the one that catches people by surprise. They don't understand why they're not paying any taxes, but then they just don't worry about it. Again, worry about it at the rate you're paying, but beware if there's a cliff coming. Yeah. And if you run out of losses in one year, that can, that can be a pretty stout thing. If you've converted, um, if you've converted to a very profitable business that is not, that has no tax strategy. So for example, a custom grazing business is what I call a cash cow business. If you're a custom grazer on leased land, right? You really don't have many expense. This is the reason it's so profitable, right? You don't have many expenses. 
you don't have any assets, right? You're you you just have cash income. Well, word to the wise, a custom grazing business is a is like having a W two job. It it could generate a significant cash liability, and and again in the in the early days of RFP, there were people that experienced that. What else is on your list? Some other major things, key points that. Yeah, a few few other things. Um, government payments, and there have been a ton of them here in the last few years with the COVID deal, are often taxable income. You will often get 1099 for that. Seems weird, right? The government's going to give me money and then they're going to turn around and tax me on it. Like, it's awesome. <laughs> the hard, one of the hardest things about our planning process is that the freaking FSA just will send payments out randomly and it never fails. You've got somebody that's on the bubble, like, yeah, we've got, we've spent enough, that sort of thing. And then an FSA deposit shows up for a drought that happened three years before, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it never fails. You know, those things are out there, but again, plan on being taxed on that. Are some of those that are not taxed, uh, but it, those, those are the, the, the minor uh, exception, if you will. Right. Yeah. CSP, uh, equip, all that stuff. All that stuff. Yep. All taxable. The, yeah. The fence grant, the stock water grant, all those things. Same, same with money you receive from the state wildlife fund. If they're doing that, like almost all those things are taxable. Yep. Um, I am lucky to live in a state with no income tax. Uh, in you know, there are what Wyoming, Nevada, South Dakota, uh, South Dakota is one, Tennessee, Texas, uh, New Hampshire. I think they're, I don't know, half dozen or a dozen of them that don't have state income tax. If you live in a state with state income tax, you need to be, you need to pay attention to that. You need to be careful. Again, California, Illinois, New York are sort of the classical, you know, terror zones. Um, It's just one of those things you need to be aware of. And, and with that, I want to bring up this idea of both payroll tax and sales tax. We deal with a fair number of direct to consumer type uh, businesses that are surprised by sales tax. We deal with a number of service businesses or, you know, it's a ranch, but then they have a service business. That service business can get caught by surprise because in many states they owe sales tax. Uh, New Mexico, in my mind, is my favorite example of a terrible state for sales tax. It's county by county. The rates are high. Colorado's bad, too. Uh, and you're the one responsible for collecting it and and reporting it to the state. We have seen cases where people don't do that for a few years, and then suddenly they have a six-figure sales tax bill that they owe to the state. I think the, the highest rates I've seen, I think, are you know in the West. New Mexico and Colorado seem to be the, the worst, mm-hmm. you know. And, and they're pretty good about enforcement. Um, if you, with that in mind, uh, if you screw that up, best thing you can do is get with a professional, do a mea culpa. Uh, New Mexico, for example, has what they call a, oh, some, I can't remember what they call, audited review, is that what's called? That, you know, it's basically a self reporting thing. You'll go through and, and determine what you owe. They'll look it over and give you a thumbs up or thumbs down. They'll, they're, they're, reasonably forgiving about it, but not unlimitedly. So, so you want to, you want to be careful on that. And, and again, pay attention in your state to the laws of, if you're, especially if you're selling stuff into different states of what the laws are about selling or performing services into another state. Most states don't tax food, um, but some do. And you don't live necessarily by the rules of your state. You live by the rules of the state that you're selling in most of the time. Right. Um, Which brings us to most, if your business is significantly direct to consumer, the IRS does not consider meat an agricultural product. Now you can make a joke about this if you want. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> exactly. Q, Q Clay banging head, his head yes. against the table like, what the heck? Okay, meat is not an agricultural product. A calf is an agricultural product and wheat is an agricultural product, but bread isn't. Okay, and so for that reason, that actually changes, if that's a significant part of your business, that actually changes the way you have to file your federal tax returns. Mm. And most people don't realize that. So that's a place where we see people get into trouble. 
The other place where we see people get into trouble is with payroll tax. We talked a little about it earlier and having an account for it. Most people don't realize that they have to pay payroll taxes. Many have to pay monthly, but usually at least quarterly. And if you're not, if you're writing checks to somebody and oh, we'll just make it up at the end of the year, that is going to get you. Um, payroll tax is a bit of a different deal because when you withhold money from someone's check, so Clay, you're an employee of ours. I pay you money. I keep, I pay hundred bucks and keep 10 or I keep $7 and 65 cents, right? I have taken that money away from you. And if I don't pay it to the feds on time, they get, they get pretty upset about it. Uh, and for good reason, you've taken the money away and then you've not paid it. Right. Uh, and again, remember you have to add $7.65 of your own, right? So there's an additional liability there, which we can argue about, but you uh, business owners are entrusted with the responsibility of collecting that money from employees and getting it to their, um, you know, getting it to the, the, the right agency, right. To the, to the feds. Um, we, we see a lot of places where people are way too casual with payroll. Uh, and, and we'll get a call at some point, you know, Hey, I need to get payroll taxes paid for last year and we didn't do their payroll or they're not a customer of ours. And it's like, yeah, you need, we don't do that. Um, you need to, you need to go to somebody that does that. And, and it's, I hate saying, I hate telling people that, but it's a, it's a headache to get it cleared up. We do do it sometimes, but it's, it's a problem. Payroll tax is a, is a payroll tax and sales tax are the kind of thing that are a severe administrative burden and you need to be set up correctly to deal with them. It doesn't have to be expensive or time consuming, but like all things, you know, prior preparation makes all the difference. Mm. Um, government payments, all the other types of taxes. Uh, oh, and then another one that I, I want to make sure people understand when we talk about when we're in the stalker business, um, we often, you know, take the South Plains as an example, right? Kansas, Oklahoma, North Texas, uh, all that area. When when we are buying stockers in the fall and selling them the next year, let's say in the summer or the, or the fall again, the purchase of those stockers is not deductible until they are sold. They are considered a cost of goods sold by the you know tax rules. Um, and so that it, different from purchasing a cow where I can deduct her the current year, right? A stalker calf doesn't show up until the next year. So in years like this past, where we were often buying calves in 2022 in the fall, right? For 900 bucks a piece and then selling them in August of 2023 for 15 to $1,800 and then buying back a calf for 15 or $1,800, we are only able to deduct the prior year's expenses, right? So we have a, a significant Im increase, right? A significant mm -hmm. short-term gain there. The buyback on those calves doesn't apply until the next year. Mm -hmm. This is actually I, something I think is a bit of a problem in our tax code, the way we do things. Nobody cares about my opinion, uh, but I, as a sell buy advocate, of course, I would argue that we should always be selling and then replacing with the buying back. Uh, again, it's a place where the tax law differs very different, you know, it's very different from business management. That's an important record to keep with your tax person, your tax person. Now, especially if you go to a new tax person, they need to be able to figure out of the cattle you sold, what did you pay for them? And that number comes, you know, oftentimes from the prior year. So we have a system that we use to keep track of that. That's super clean. You need to make sure you can do that. Um, one of the reasons we advocate so strongly for things, you know, like inventory management, you know, written uh, computerized tracking of inventory is for exactly that reason. It gives us the ability to track the actual cost of what we, what we bought and what we sold. Uh, John, I think this might be the lowest percentage of talking I've done on an episode to date, maybe in 350, whatever, eight episodes this might be. Uh, and that's because you were very prepared and I appreciate that. And I, and I was sitting here, uh, learning and, um, just under, just taking it in and you were thorough and, and answering a lot of my follow-up questions before I got to ask them. So um, were there other things you wanted to cover and, and things that I should have asked follow-up questions I should have asked uh, that, that you want to touch on now? No, I think you're good. We could talk about this for hours and nobody would listen. So when you look at your <laughs> listenership and they're like, Oh, taxes. Yeah. I'll never listen to that episode. <laughs> uh, uh, no, I, I think we we've covered a lot of it. Uh, I'm going to repeat 
you know, never cheat on taxes. The tax code are the rules of the road. Use them to your advantage. We're given tax advantages in our industry. Use them. Uh, I don't, I, I believe in optimizing your tax rate, not min, not necessarily minimizing it. The goal is to, my goal and the goal of many of us is to maximize after tax wealth. So don't be, you know, ranching for profit says, don't worry about taxes. And I, and I generally agree with that. That said, when we deal with very profitable customers who've done a great job implementing all of these things, taxes become one of your largest expenses. And at that point, they deserve serious attention. Yeah. And that serious attention comes in in preparation, right? In planning, it comes from strategy and good tactics related to your strategy that that build allow you to build your business. Uh, over and over again, I am absolutely amazed by our customers and their ability to generate significant profit and convert that into wealth. Mm. And and that is an awesome thing to watch. Over and over again in our industry, we hear about how bad it is. I don't see that on a daily basis. I see how good it is, and it is really good. Yeah, very good. Well, John, thank you so much for your time today. Clay, it's an honor. I love what you do. Uh, you know that this is you. You have begun a whole trend of things that has transformed education in our business, and I absolutely love it. So, thank you. It's a real honor to participate. Appreciate it. Thank you. I appreciate that. All glory to God. Very good stuff there, as always, with John. Really appreciate him. Uh, taking the time and uh, really looking forward to next week on the Working Cows podcast. We will be talking to somebody from the team at Understanding Ag, taking a deep dive on some of the principles that they teach in their schools, the Soil Health Academy, and some of the work that they're doing with Regenified and, and all of the other uh, things, all the different ores that they have in the water over there at Understanding Ag. So looking forward to that, and we will see you again real soon on another episode of the Working Cows podcast. We invite you to visit workingcows.net to subscribe to the show via iTunes or Stitcher. You'll also find detailed show notes pages, resources from our guests, and the industry leaders who have influenced them. For more ideas on putting your cows to work for you in a more profitable way, tune in next week. Next week.